Next, from Springfield, we hear from retired law professor John Kent, who tells us why voters should reject the constitutional amendment they'll vote on on the November ballot. This runs about 20 minutes. Professor John Kent with the University of Illinois, thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Well, I'm glad to be here. I'm in my uh, 34th, 35th season, as we say in showbiz. We uh, asked you to come in to discuss, uh, again, a uh, the pension that is, or I'm sorry, the amendment that will be on the fall ballot, and again, I think a lot of people are unaware there will be a constitutional amendment on the fall ballot that they're going to be asked to vote on. And interestingly, as you showed me in some papers here, uh, they won't even be able to read what the amendment says on the ballot. It'll be a summation of, of what it would do. You are opposed to the passage of the amendment. Uh, tell us why you're opposed to it. What, what do you think it would do that would be harmful? I, I just think it's sloppy. And uh, my colleagues... Slopping its wording? Slopping mean? its wording, poorly drafted, not properly vetted. It's got all kinds of problems in it across the board that affect the entire political spectrum. I think everybody should be against this just as, as a, a silly constitutional amendment. And, and the bottom line on this is if you trust Springfield, vote for this amendment. If you don't trust Springfield, you should vote against this amendment. People should ask why this amendment is even on the ballot. And in your estimation, why is this uh, amendment on the ballot? I think that this amendment uh, is on the ballot to override, in part, the constitutional protection in the 1970 Illinois Constitution that says that benefits should not be diminished or impaired. Now, it does a lot more than that. So public sector employees ought to be very uh, energized by what uh, this uh, constitutional amendment will do. It'll, it'll override their constitutional protection, but it'll also override the constitutional protections of, the, of all people in the state of Illinois. And very frankly, if this thing passes, my political science colleagues say, you're going to see all kinds of ridiculous legislation uh, coming out in January of next year, uh, simply because the legislature knows that they've kind of pulled one over on the people of Illinois. Uh, this is going to send a real message to the people in Springfield, uh, basically from a political standpoint, and, and again I'm referring to my political, uh, political science colleagues, uh, this is going to send a real message. If, if this slips through, uh, the genie's out of the bottle. Everything's on the table. Um, it, now, how, looks, how, it sounds good. I don't mean to sure. interrupt too much, but when you say that, uh, why would it impact anything other than, say, pensions? Well, well, first of all, if you start reading through it, it says you need a three-fifths vote to increase uh, uh, benefits, and it starts out very nice. But it's, it's 700 words long. It's got more words in it than the entire first ten amendments to the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Who is putting together a 700-word constitutional amendment? And why is it a constitutional amendment? Because the state legislature can make these changes simply by passing a law. All they have to do is pass a law. So why is it a constitutional amendment? It's okay. there well, to eliminate the constitutional protection that's in the 1970 uh, cons Illinois Constitution. When you say all they'd have to do is pass a law, would they not have to pass a constitutional amendment to raise the measure for passage from a simple majority to three-fifths? Well, they can accomplish, the, the, the for, from a practical standpoint, you can accomplish the same thing. I mean, you talk to any legislature who, uh, legislator who will be candid with you, and they'll simply say, anytime we need three-fifths vote, we just go around and get three-fifths vote, or, or we'll get a majority vote to do certain things. Uh, you don't need this draconian constitutional amendment uh, to accomplish what they allegedly say they would like to accomplish with this. Thing. And not to be argumentative, but sure. they would say, uh, you know, if you're going out for a three, obviously by simple math, it's going to take more votes for a three-fifths passage than a 51% or 50% passage. And so the more you have, the harder it is to get uh, to get passage, which the proponents would say is exactly what this amendment's designed to do, that we've had 
uh, increases in pensions over the years that have happened, some would argue, because there are different unions, whether it's the firefighters or different ones that might be contributing to someone's campaign, and therefore they say, in return, we want an increase in pensions, and voila. So now the state finds itself going broke on the fast track because of the growth of pensions, among other things, not, not merely that. And I'm just trying to lay the case sure, from the sure. proponent standpoint. They are saying, therefore, if we're going to address these pension issues uh, as they partially have by having a new pension benefit formula for the new hires, and they want to go and address the pension benefits of those who are existing workers, those hired before January of 2011, uh, they would say, you know, we want to protect the taxpayer going forward by having a constitutional amendment that would make it harder on future legislat uh, legislatures to make the sins of the past to increase these pension benefits. And so we'll go from a simple majority to three-fifths. Now, again, I'll, st I'll stop, but I just wanted to lay, I think that's no, more I, or less I, the I, argument of the proponents. I, fine, I understand that, that argument. Uh, but you can simply do this... Uh, and I don't want to say piecemeal, but you can take one situation or one problematic scenario at a time and pass legislation to address that. You don't need a constitutional amendment to do that. Now, what does this really do? It basically takes a lot of the decision-making capabilities out of local governmental units, uh, out of the university system. Um, it redefines who's going to be making these decisions, and the practical effect is that it simply concentrates more and more decision-making power in Springfield, monetary and budgetary power in Springfield. I mean, you've got to admit that, even from your from what you've indicated from the pro proponents' arguments are indicating, yeah, we're, we're going to take this out of local government hands and we're going to concentrate it here in Springfield. Now, we have an $85 billion and growing um, uh, problem with the state budget in Illinois. Um, it's gone up. 85 billion unfunded, unfunded liabilities, liabilities in the it's pensions. It's gone up from 83 to 85 just in the last couple of months. 83 billion to 85 billion. Now, as I said at the beginning, if you trust Springfield, vote for this amendment. If well, you don't trust Springfield, and you don't trust the judgment and what they've done already, then I think that there should be this balance of power, and, and we are entire federal and state government that's predicated on the balance of power. And this is concentrating more power by means of a constitutional amendment in Springfield. And, and you, you being a lawyer and law professor, you know the, the uh, I'll ask, I'll, I'll, I'll pose a, a point okay, I think sir. the opponents would make at this point. They would, they would jump on your statement, I think, and say, well, you know, um, we agree with you. You don't want to trust those in Springfield, which is why we're going to make it harder for them to pass benefits that will hurt the taxpayers. We're going to go from a constitutionally mandated 50 percent, which is current law, to a three-fifths, a supermajority. Therefore, we don't trust Springfield. We're going to make it harder for them to pass. Sure. What's wrong with their argument? Let, let, let's just let's just twist the arguments around. Let's put the spin on the arguments. We need to constantly get back and refocus on exactly what this constitutional amendment would do. So, so instead, of, I don't want to get misdirected on minor types of issues. This is a constitutional amendment. It's going to have a huge impact on the entire political spectrum in Illinois. And it passed uh, under very unusual circumstances. Uh, first of all, practically everybody voted for it. In the House, it was virtually unanimous. There were some voting present or, or who were absent. In the Senate, there were only two votes that were against it uh, in its passage. Now, it passed virtually unanimously which comes back to my point about passing legislation. If you wanted to pass legislation to address five or six or seven problems that they say this constitutional amendment is going to remedy, why didn't they just do that? They had all the votes they needed right there to get that done. Well, but, no, but I, 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 I mean to be fair, I, sure. again, okay. I don't mean to be arguing, I want to have you tell us your side and, and get a... They would, I think people would say, look, you, you can get three-fifths on this, but if we try to pass, right? I, uh, let's you know what. Rather than me doing this, because I'm afraid we're we're gonna. I don't want to get you off track too much. 
what what this amendment, let's just go back to square ground zero here on this. What allegedly this constitutional amendment would do is to raise the level of majority from a, a 50% or 51% to th three fifths. Now that's more or less what the proponents would stop and say that's all it does. Those who oppose it, which you're speaking to, say no, it, it does much more than that. And I, so I want to give you the chance to move well, on to, to sure. that and, I, I, and get your primary themes out. And I'll say for the viewers, there's also a oddly worded paragraph, which is right. paragraph D, as you noted, there's 700 and something words. So we get to the fourth paragraph, paragraph D, that uh, maybe at, at a point I'll read that well, go, go ahead and read it now. Well, okay, let's say it says, and this is the, this is the last paragraph of, of the amendment, but it's on page four as you print this out. And uh, paragraph D says, nothing in this section shall prevent the passage or adoption of any law, ordinance, resolution, rule, policy, or practice that further restricts the ability to provide a, quote, benefit increase, quote, emollient increase or quote beneficial determination as those terms are used under this section. Now speaking for myself and having just read that I have no idea what that means. That's right and, and the law it's only language which lawyers could love. They're going to sit around and debate this but the question then is if you're a judge and you have to interpret this and you have to interpret one constitutional amendment basically overriding another constitutional provision, you're going to look at this and you're going to say, well, this looks to me like a blank check to the legislature to make quote unquote beneficial determinations. Now, we can argue about the meaning of that, but every legal expert that I have talked to says that this is a threat. Now, I think the majority of legal experts say this totally bring, uh, brings the genie out of the bottle. It's a blank check to the legislature. Other experts with whom I have conferred indicate it's less of a threat, but everybody says it's a threat. And let me, so, can I interject just, yes, how long have you been in the law? How long have I been an attorney? An attorney, and, and you're an attorney and a law professor, and how well, long have well, you been in and around the law? And I want to lay the foundation, so to speak, for, my, my point is, sure. if you don't know what it means, well, uh, how would the average person okay. coming in to vote on this, especially when they don't even get to read the amendment on the ballot? Okay, well, I, I've, I've uh, been an attorney since uh, 1976. Um, I'm, I'm not practicing here, and officially I'm retired, uh, but uh, I, I have, and I don't mean to be presumptuous, but I have three earned law degrees and a, and a degree in business, graduate degree in business as well and uh, have been teaching this, uh, like we said, uh, 34, uh, now I'm in my 35th season, uh, teaching on, and, on these And again, you don't know what the paragraph I just read meant. Well, I read it over and over and over, and I read it in the context of the rest of it. And I'm saying, why is this even in here? And by the way, this sentence was added at the last minute. I don't even think a lot of legislators knew that it was being added in at the last minute, right before this passed. And, and frankly, I think a lot of legislators are now rethinking the issue now that they've seen this sentence in there and, and they're concerned about it. Um, but uh, you have to ask, in the process itself, why was why 700 words in a constitutional amendment? You could say the same thing on the three-fifths vote in two sentences. I was just going to say, paragraph. if all it did was three-fifths, I'm right. not going to argue your point anymore. But I'm I'm right. just raising the issues. Right. Uh, if all it was saying is three-fifths, you yeah. could probably have a two-sentence paragraph right. uh, or amendment. Yeah, like, like I said, we've got the first ten amendments to the U.S. Constitution. And it's less words than there are in this. This is poorly drafted. And, but then you have to ask, what was the intent? Why is it so long? And it's not even printed on the ballot. People won't have a chance to read it on the ballot. There's only a summary on the ballot. Uh, and um, I think that raises concerns as well. People don't know what they're voting on. It's not on the ballot. If you were presenting a legal, A, could you present a legal challenge if this amendment, constitutional amendment passed? Could there be a legal challenge to it, or is that not allowed uh, on a constitutional I, 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 amendment? Well, um, 
and, and see if, uh, or, or the second follow-up to that is, if there was allowed to be a legal challenge, would, um, would the fact that it didn't appear on the ballot be grounds for part of the challenge? Uh, well, I think that would be one of the arguments. Uh, but I think there are other arguments. For example, uh, Secretary Jesse White has sent out the amendment to postal patrons and to potential voters, uh, but it's only in English. Well, it's on the ballot in Chicago, a summary is on the ballot in Chicago in both English and Spanish. Well, why didn't Jesse White send out the entire brochure in English and Spanish? Uh, if there's a necessity to have Spanish on the ballot in Chicago, shouldn't there also be the necessity to submit the entire amendment in Spanish? The point is, point is, it's confusing. Nobody's going to know what they're voting on. Uh, and, and I think that that raises serious uh, constitutional problems, uh, both at a state level and probably at a federal level. But uh, I would ha want to talk to colleagues about that. I'm confused a little bit about some of what you said. Now, we, we covered the three-fifths part, part, but uh, who would this actually apply to? What, does it just apply to the legislature? To whom does this constitutional amendment apply as far as having a three-fifths majority? Well, I think it's the entire state of Illinois. I, I think it, it's all governmental units. You mean by that? Any, yeah, any government any, unit. Any governmental unit. Now, again, we're going to be arguing about what the definitions are in, in this constitutional amendment. Why are we even arguing about this? Why are we discussing this? Uh, and, and, and I like you a lot, Mr. Martin, but why are we even having this interview? This is a sloppy piece of, of uh, constitutional amendment. It's just plain sloppy. Uh, and people need to ask, there should be red, there are red flags up all over this. And people should ask, why 700 words? Why there's only a summary on the ballot? Why was this very draconian sentence that, that allegedly takes away all uh, protect, constitutional protections on, uh, on diminishment of benefits? Why was that added on at the last second? Why was this drafted outside the normal legislative uh, processes of most legislation? There are, just, there are lots of red flags on this. People should be very concerned. And, and I think the bottom line, as my colleagues have, has, uh, have expressed, is if you trust Springfield, vote for it. If you don't trust Springfield, you should vote against it. The, um the aspect of the that that last paragraph, and you you would argue in in uh, well, what I wanted to lay out is that in the we, we touched on it, but it might have been lost. In the current Illinois Constitution, written in 1970, right. there are protections against uh, well, there are protections for state workers' pensions, right, and therefore because of the cost of the exploding cost of pensions that the state is now facing. They were able constitutionally to address the cost for new hires because new hires come in under a different deal. There was no question there, or well, there wasn't much of a question of the constitutionality of that. But there would be a huge question as far as trying to go to those who have already been working and earning a pension. Some would say um, that if you've been working for 15 years, you may have earned what you've earned up to the current day, but I could change the law tomorrow and going forward your benefits are different and lower. Others are going to say no, that would violate the constitutional protection of the 1970 Constitution. Right. So, with that as a foundation, what I'm getting at is kind of to your point. Why is this a constitutional amendment? And I think your argument is that this could be a Trojan horse that this would allow, especially in paragraph D because of the obscure wording of it, right. that it may give constitutional protection for those who in the future would come in, or the legislature in the future could in the spring say all existing state workers hired before the uh, 2011 when they changed it for new hires, 
Now we're going to change your pensions and you no longer have the constitutional guarantee that was granted you in 1970. Is that yeah, more yeah. or less a summation of... Well, well, I'm sorry to go on so I, I, long, I, I, but I, I wanted to... I want to simplify. See if I could, okay. Why is it even here? I mean, this opens up a whole Pandora's box. I don't want to mix my metaphors too much. Well, can, can we, before we but maybe simplify, did I lay that out right? Is that more or less your that, concern? That, that would be one major argument and one major concern, yes. Um, the... Uh, uh, but it, it's not just my opinion. It's been really interesting to see who's come out against this in just the last month or so. I mean, we've had uh, the first one of the first groups to come out was the State University uh, uh, Annuitants. Annuitants Association, who came out against it. Uh, then AFSCME came out against it. Uh, since then, the AFL's uh, CIO has come out against it. Uh, the fraternal, uh, I think it's the Chicago FOP, Fraternal Order of Police, has, has come out against it. Uh, I believe it's the Universal Fraternal Order of Police has come out against it. Very, uh, the Illinois Education Association is, is against it. Um, various uh, public sector groups are against it. And interesting, the League of Women Voters, is my understanding, is also against it. Now, when you've got the League of Women Voters saying, what's going on here, I, I think you've got a bipartisan, uh, social concern, we're not talking special interests here, we're just saying that this is a bipartisan social concern on why this is on the ballot. Um, what's, why, why is it there? You could do this with a simple constitutional amendment if you really wanted to do it. As we but said, it, a, a very so more simply worded. It's so obscure with so many nebulous terms in it and dangerous terms in it that I think people should be very concerned. Now, if it fails, on the November ballot, uh, then would you be willing to work with lawmakers to craft, you or others uh, who are opposed to it, to craft a more simple amendment that would say, Absolutely. we'll we'll have uh, maybe three fifths or some protection, but maybe without that paragraph D that is as convoluted as it is as it is. Absolutely, I think there are plenty of mechanisms for addressing the problems that we have here in this in the state of Illinois. If this thing passes, my political science associates say it's a blank check. We're going to see all kinds of bizarre legislation being introduced in January. Uh, we have no idea what benefits are going to be attacked. Every, every little pot of gold anywhere is going to be subject to, to scrutiny, regardless of the public health, safety, and welfare, regardless of good government. The state is so desperate for money, they're, they're looking to, to get this genie out of the bottle and to be able to go wherever they want to go, instead of doing what they should have done to begin with, which is responsible budgeting, and facing the hard choices. All right, we'll end it there. And we, <laughs> Professor John Kent, we well, appreciate you, so you taking. Much. It was really nice seeing you. <laughs> you as well. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. You're watching the Illinois Channel.